Okay, so we'll, we'll continue our conversation around prophetic literature, but now we're focusing on the latter prophets, the other part of the prophetic literature. So we're talking about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the scroll of the Twelve, the book of the Twelve, okay? And the, the graphic, the piece of art there is, is from uh, the Dome of the Jeshu in Rome, and it's, it's got a number of the Old Testament prophets, Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Isaiah, all in the one part of the cornice. I thought that's a cute picky to put who up they, there. Who are they looking up at? I don't know. I don't know. They, they could be looking for... I don't, I, I don't know the larger, the larger context. Okay, so if we're mapping the prophets, this is just the other part of the conversation we had earlier today. Um, we know that the, this is where at least the, the Greek tradition and the Jewish tradition agree that these are prophetic texts. The difference is that in the Jewish tradition, in the Hebrew Bible, Daniel is not among the prophets. It's in the writings, the Kethuvim. Whereas, as we've seen, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, and then Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Twelve constitute the prophetic literature um, from a Jewish perspective. The Greek Bible, which was originally itself inherently Jewish, it was simply Greek-speaking Jews producing the what we call the Septuagint, okay? it, it includes Daniel and it unpacks the Twelve as 12 separate books and it distinguishes between long prophets and short prophets by saying major prophets, minor prophets. And they don't mean that Amos is an insignificant prophet, they're simply saying it's not one of the big three, it's one of the smaller prophetic texts. Okay. Um, okay, so let's just jump straight back in to the same kind of conversation we've been having. So in terms of textual criticism, same thing. We've got our major um, manuscript witnesses. We have the Septuagint versions, of course, in the Christian Bibles. We have uh, the um, prophetic texts which have been preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And as we've seen, Isaiah is one of the most popular manuscripts, biblical manuscripts from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Jeremiah, we have six examples of Jeremiah. Um, from Dead Sea, so he wasn't as popular as Isaiah. Six copies of Ezekiel, which is a little bit surprising given the social location and the theological perspective of the grumpy old priests from the temple who went into self-imposed exile at Qumran, you'd think they'd be all over Ezekiel. Okay, and they're not, it's, it's not, it's really no more represented than Joshua or Judges is represented. Certainly not up there with Jeremiah, with um, Isaiah, and so on. So a little bit surprising that Ezekiel is not more represented among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Book of the Twelve, I love this, has between seven and twelve manuscripts. Okay, none of them have all twelve of the prophets, but but five of them, I think it is. This is way too much information, but five of them do have more than one prophet. In other words, they didn't just have a Micah scroll or an Amos scroll. They're all, they're all what we've got left are books which once had more than, more than one and we don't know how many. So, um, so we don't actually have an example of all 12 prophets on the one scroll, but we have half a dozen examples at least of, of prophetic scrolls that have more than one of the Book of the Twelve on the same fragment. Okay, so it's tantalizing. It's not the data we want, it's the data we have. Okay, and again, the reason for the difference between 7 and 12 is that at least some of the other ones are probably pesherim, in other words, commentaries on the book of the 12. But as I said, that's actually even better in a sense because that means they not only had the book, they were writing commentaries on the book. And they were seeing it as having such significance that they were actually writing explanatory material based around the biblical text. Okay. So Deuteronomy, just to reiterate, 28 to 30 manuscripts. Isaiah 21, Psalms 35 to 37. So Isaiah is theological heartland for the Qumran people as it was for the New Testament people. And as it happens, as with the book of Samuel, 
so with the book of Jeremiah there are some major textual problems when you compare the Greek text with the Hebrew text and we find some of those same issues being reflected in the Hebrew manuscripts from Qumran. So these are these differences between the long and the short form of Jeremiah or even the order of the chapters in Jeremiah they go right back into like 200 years before the time of Jesus. These are not issues that developed in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century after Christ. They were issues before the Old Testament was finished there were already different versions of some of the books which is what you would expect given the processes of of handwritten documents. I mean how do you do document management okay with scrolls version documents and um, version management and so on. So not surprisingly there are issues. It's it's remarkable actually that the biblical manuscripts have so few versions and that that reflects the seriousness with which these particular documents were regarded. They were treated with great care. It doesn't mean they're perfect, but they were treated with exceptional levels of respect and care. Okay, um, form criticism. Um, the major issue around form criticism with respect to the prophetic literature relates to the, the, the prophetic oracle. Because now we're not dealing with so much narrative material, but pronouncements, oracles, um, pieces of spoken text which are delivered by the prophet. And so they're poetic rather than prose a lot of the time. There will be little bits of prose, but to introduce or to wrap up a prophetic, it's almost like when they went into their zone, the prophets spoke in poetry did their thinking in poetry. Now that, of course, the, the, so what's the big chunk of the Old Testament where, you, where you're going to find poetry, apart from the prophets? What's the other? Psalms. The Psalms. Psalms. Okay, good. We haven't even got there yet. So you do know stuff, right? So, so if the prophetic mode of speech and delivery is, is in Hebrew poetic form, and if that's the form we typically find connected with the Psalter, with the book of Psalms, with the context of the temple, then it, it could suggest that the prophets are deliberately playing into that kind of a mode, that kind of a context. They, either they are delivering their pronouncements in a liturgical space, liturgical context, or they're taking a familiar form which will be known from the temple liturgy and applying it in some other location. Okay? And so that gives us a, so it begins to unpack some of the dynamics around this text. For instance, we know that um, uh, one of the ways in which you could ritualize your hatred for another group of people was to write their name on a pot and then ceremonially smash the pot. But what happens if the prophet writes Jerusalem on the pot? and smashes the pot in the name of Yahweh. Taking a recognized form, but turning it back on the audience. Okay. So a lot of what we're dealing with seems to be forms, a genre, which derive from the temple and the court and the palace. In other words, the major centers of public power in an Iron Age society. Um, and there was a close convergence of king, priest, and justice. Okay, the king in many ways was the ultimate magistrate, the determiner. But the uh, and the king in some ways, uh, although it's difficult to pick this up in the Old Testament because it's not what the Old Testament is written about. But what was the liturgical function of the king of Israel in the temple in Jerusalem? Okay, what was his function? Now that's and to what extent? Um, did the did the high priest was he simply the appointee of the king, or did he did he acquire other prerogatives in public life? So this dynamic, and the, and then the emergence of the prophetic oracle or material within that context, particularly if this is a person who's holding a position and is supposed to toe the party line, and in fact in the name of Yahweh 
he speaks against the party line. Okay, what's going on there? Um, so one of the things you you could, you could there's a thing called the rib, which is when you lodge a complaint against your neighbour, and sometimes the prophets lodge a complaint by Yahweh against Israel. So it's like I'm hitting you with a subpoena. God's not happy. He wants to see you in court tomorrow, eleven o'clock. Now, not our legal system as the context, but there are social norms which are being exploited for the point of getting the message across. And are also shaping how the prophet sees the issue. Part of it is the context, particularly in the late Iron Age, in other words, Assyrian period, the, the context of um, covenant obligations. Um, that I'm the king of Assyria, I have conquered you, but I didn't destroy you. And you are so grateful, you love me because I didn't destroy you. And so we have a covenant and you will be like a son to me and I will be like your father. And in return, you'll send me truckloads of gold every year. And you will write down a copy of this covenant and put it in your temple. And at least once a year, you'll bring it out and you'll read it out to everybody to remind them who's in charge around here. And if you break the covenant, I will wipe your nose in the dirt and send you off as slaves. Now, if that sounds vaguely like the Old Testament, that's because the Old Testament comes out of the Assyrian cultural context in Palestine. So the, the king of Assyria treats us like this. The king of Egypt treats us like this. This is how we imagine our relationship with Yahweh as well. So in, when the prophets are using covenant language to talk about breach of trust, they're taking political categories, but they're theologizing them. And they're not separate worlds because the real world consequence of breaching the covenant with Yahweh is that the Assyrian army will be at the front gate. So it's not like um, God's going to be unhappy with you, your grapevine is going to wither or something. No, no, there's an army outside and they're about to burn your town down because you upset Yahweh. So there's an interesting capacity to see pagan enemy forces as instruments of God's judgment, which must have made them very popular in the cabinet room. So the prophet is the representative and speaker, spokesman in the old language, for Yahweh. The prophet is not a predictor so much as an advisor, a forth teller. Source criticism, of course, the big issue there will relate around, so how do we get from Isaiah doing his stuff to the book of Isaiah? Did he write it down? Did he have someone running around taking notes? Did he sit down afterwards and do his journal before he went to bed at night? You know, what's going on here? Is he about to put out the diary of a foreign minister? And yeah, which Isaiah might have been, you know? In some he seems to have been a high-ranking official in the court of Jerusalem who'd served Uzziah faithfully for many, many decades. And then when there's a change of king to the young prince, he becomes like the spokesman for the other side, constantly challenging and confronting um, the, the new king. So is he going to publish his memoirs? So, you know, and the short answer is we don't know, okay? Because they didn't tell us, but there are within the prophetic text there are various references to um, sort of writing activity and there's also the cultural context that you would record the terms of the covenant the treaty and put it somewhere for safekeeping so some of that appears to be playing into what's going on here so issues around source criticism authorship compilation the relationship between the scroll and the actual words of the prophet and and I think it's fair to say that as we move further through the period, when you're talking about someone like Jeremiah, you've got somebody who's intentionally using written material as part of his message, part of his practice. In the case of Isaiah, a hundred years or so earlier, you've probably got somebody who's acting orally, but whose, whose words are being remembered and recorded. But Isaiah himself is not consciously using the written record as part of his toolbox. Whereas Jeremiah it is, and even to the point where he sends his offsider, Baruch, 
to go and read his letter to the king. I think it's uh, Jeremiah 36. And the king has his pocket knife out. And as the scroll, Shaphan is, as the secretary is reading the scroll, the king is chopping off the bits you've just read. Like, really arrogant. I'm eating my apple and so much for the word of Yahweh. Okay? And drops the pieces into the fire. Okay? Classic scene of the prophet has sent the scroll. It's being read by the secretary. And the king is just dishing it, putting it through the shredder. Destroying it. So what happens? Barak goes home says, to Jeremiah, who's under arrest, and says, well, that didn't go down too well. <laughs> he wasn't very impressed. He chopped it up. So he said, well, sit down. And he dictated again, and he added more words to what he'd read the first time. So a second edition comes out with even more oracles of judgment. Okay, So we get a little window into the social dynamics. But that's in a literate society with literate characters. Not all the prophets are literate. Amos is a, um, a shepherd, part-time shepherd, and part-time um, sort of fruit tree trimmer. So he's doing seasonal work, okay, uh, around Tekoa, uh, not far from Bethlehem. Um, so he's not going to be literate. He's going to be oral, and yet Amos is the earliest of the prophetic um, books. I mean, the, the words of Amos come first in the Old Testament series of written prophets, but, but Amos himself almost certainly didn't write them down because he wouldn't have had that sort of literary background. So there are those sort of issues going on. And also, the, uh, in the course of the larger uh, prophetic scrolls, like Isaiah and Jeremiah, and particularly, you actually get significant extracts from the relevant bits of kings being included in the scroll of the prophets. So there's, a, there's an actual, con they're not just referring, they're actually copying material from First and Second Kings into Isaiah or Jeremiah. So that's interesting as well. And what does that imply about if you're, if you're reading my scroll of the prophet Jeremiah, I can't assume that you have access to a copy of Kings. So if there's something I want you to have, I've got to put it in my scroll. So again, it's a, it's a window into the formative process of these texts. One of the interesting questions, and one of the questions I find interesting anyway, is the question, did the Torah exist by the time of the prophets? Or was the Torah generated as a response to the prophets? Now, because we all know that the Torah comes first. Because it's, it's in the look at the Bible, turn left, there's the Pentateuch, okay? We know it's there. Okay. But was it there when the prophets were doing their stuff? If so, how come they never referred to it? Or rarely referred to it? If you're going to take the kings of Israel to task, because they're not obeying the words and the requirements of the covenant, which the Lord our God gave to Moses his servant, why not refer to Deuteronomy? Why not refer to Leviticus? Why not refer to Numbers? Why not mention Moses? Why not, for starters, just say, hey guys, remember the Ten Commandments? Well, guess what? You're not much good on number one. You're hopeless on number two. You've really messed up with number five. Okay? The prophets never do that. Did they not know their Bible? Or did their Bible not exist? And whatever Bible they had, did it not include the Torah, if they had anything? Okay, now the logic of the text as we have it tells us that the Torah comes first and the prophets are calling people back to faithfulness to Torah. But the practice of the prophets suggests that the prophets come first and the Torah is the encapsulation of the faithfulness to which the people were being called by the prophets. Okay. Now that's one of those hot button issues in Old Testament scholarship. How do we, how do we work out what's going on between? And in the end, the law trumps the prophets. It's the law and the prophets, and it's the law which is the bit that really is constitutive. The prophets is kind of the secondary part of the Jewish canon. But was did the prophets have a copy of Deuteronomy in their back pocket, assuming they had pockets? Okay, or were those traditions still in? oral form and not yet 
not yet crystallized to the point that Amos and Hosea and so on could quote them. So tricky, a bit tricky. Does it matter? No. <laughs> It's not going to make us a better Christian or a better person or a worse person, whether we've got the answer right or wrong. But it, it invites us to see the scriptures in a different set of dynamics and to engage with scriptures in a way that inform our practice rather than thinking we're, we're defending some immutable, you know, casting concrete kind of set of realities from the ancient past. Yes. Yeah, no, good good question, which this little beastie will not have picked up this one here, so I'll just repeat it a bit. So yeah, so given that, I mean, this, your question was, is there only so many copies? Well, the, the, the limited number of copies is relating to copies we have from Qumran or whatever. That's a different issue, but it's a good way into the bigger question, which is, where do we imagine literature happened in ancient Israel and ancient Judah? Who could read and write? who did read and write, and how many copies would they make of something which they were reading or writing. Okay, um, So this, this is when you go back into social science type stuff. It might even be something in a couple of slides coming up, but anyway, we'll skip over it if it is. Um, and so like it's, it's virtually impossible to imagine the children of Israel, you know, two million of them walking through the desert for 40 years, so on, there's that number again. Um, and being literate, because literacy is a function in the ancient world and even in non-so-called you know, third world countries. Literacy is a function of a certain level of social organization where you have a need to basically keep records. And that particularly means tax records and land ownership records. They're the things that drive literacy. Now. Uh, and the other, the other place where literacy becomes important is in the temple, because you've got to have scientists, you've got to have people that, with good eyesight, long-sighted, not short-sighted, who can look at the stars and calculate the seasons and keep meticulous records. So, because you, if you offer the, sacri the right sacrifice on the wrong day, God is not impressed, whichever God, okay? So it's, it's important, according to the priests at least, that you do the sacrifices on the right day and I'm the only person who can tell you when the right day is because I've got good eyesight and I'm trained to do this stuff. So technical learning, scientific knowledge, astronomy or astrology and literacy are hallmarks of a centralised society which is going to be centred around some combination of palace and temple. Okay? And the temple are basically the retainers who do all the religious stuff to validate the political decisions of the ruler. And if the ruler changes his mind or gets overthrown, then the priests change their tune. So in many ways, the temple hierarchy, like the Canberra bureaucracy, when there's a change of government, they change their policy recommendations. But the, um, the literacy and the tech, tech, technical knowledge of the bureaucracy continues from one administration to the other. That's the theory. So um, in terms of ancient Israel, there's, there's, not really to go, there's not going to be written literature until you have a centralized ruler, strong central government. That doesn't mean you won't have oral literature, that there won't be even quite complex oral stories, but you're not going to have lists other than genealogies and things like that, which are important for other reasons. So, so then in, in the context of the temple, they're not publishing, they're not making 25,000 copies of the book of Samuel. Okay, so whoever's written Joshua Judges, Samuel Kings, um, it's a very limited circulation document. It might even only exist in one document. And then as it wears out, it'll be copied. And when it does get recopied, some of the things which have been written in the margins in the meantime will be added in. And they might inadvertently um, paraphrase the paragraph and make it longer or shorter than it was in the original version. So we end up by the second or third century with parallel versions of Samuel 
parallel versions of Jeremiah with things in different orders. But there aren't going to be many copies around. And actually, even the Bible itself tells us that. I mean, in um, Maccabees, it talks about the need to recover the lost books. And and the idea was that they, um, you know, they took the view that in the time of the exile, Nebuchadnezzar, etc., the temple is burned and and the documents in the temple are destroyed because it's burned to the ground um, so but there were a few copies here and there so they sent people out to um, to recover the lost scrolls and bring them back in but they still only made one collection and then all the copies that were made were copied from the temple copy so that, and this is how you get um, version control do, um, document control the canonical copy is the copy that exists in the high priest's office. And and if you can get a copy made by the temple scribe, which is authorised as an official copy of the copy held by the high priest, then you know you've got the real thing. But it's minimal number of copies. And, and that kind of publication industry is a feature of the Hellenistic and Herodian period, not the Iron Age period. So there are going to be very few copies, like Isaiah's scroll presumably existed as one copy. And it might have probably did grow over a hundred years or so to become a much larger document, but there would have been one copy. Okay, there would, and there may have been bits of it that scribes had copied out while practicing, learning their craft, but we're not looking at a print run of even 500 copies. We're looking at one or two copies, max. So if the cockroaches get into the back of the temple, there goes Isaiah. Okay. So, so this is so. Yeah, we're we're dealing with um, limited number of documents, limited number of people who could read. Um, almost certainly, the kings would not be literate. Some people say that's still the case for politicians, but you know. Um, you know, you have you have secretaries for that. You have scholars to do that. You have priests to do that. Um, the, ten, the the king has to be a good soldier, rather than a good scholar kind of thing. So yeah, so we've got to we've got to move away from our Western post printing press mindset, and go back to the world where documents were rare, and highly valued and actually could be valued as much as a physical keepsake than for any capacity to read the words on the page. Remember the story of the Aleppo Codex. One of the, some of the lost pages have turned up in Argentina because as when the Codex was smuggled out of Syria in the 1940s, some of the pages were used as good luck charms. And so they, they turned up in the Jewish community in Argentina. Not because they could read the ancient Hebrew text, but because this is a page from the oldest copy of the Torah. So it was a, you know, good luck to have it. Bad luck for the book. Good luck for the owner of the page. Okay. Similarly, the, um, the Bible in Durham Cathedral. Um, is it the Bible or the book of... It's a, a, Particularly significant ancient English book. I'm not sure if it's a Bi I think it's the Bible, but it could be another of the ancient English royal documents. But a different over the centuries, um, as dignitaries have come to the cathedral, the Bishop of Durham would give them a page from this ancient codex. Well, now we go. <laughs> you can't do that. They had a different attitude towards antiquities, and this is all part of the change so yeah so we can imagine Amos has said this stuff and it's been remembered first of all it's been remembered and they're just you should have heard what Amos said today and they would have been rehearsing the you know and if he if he gave out a really good well crafted line that would be part of what made it easier to remember and if they're using poetry that also helps to make it easier to remember it so as part of the control of the tradition but at some point Amos's words turn into a text and then at some later stage Amos's text becomes part of the book of the twelve and, and and we can't really reconstruct that process all we can see is that it's happened and it's been an incredible gift to the world that that sort of thing has happened <coughs>
So, of course, people want to then say, well, Old Testament scholars at least, start saying, so where's the Deuteronomist in all this? Has he had his fingers in here as well? Because if the Deuteronomist, I mean, this is partly saying, so who were the, um, where were the social locations in ancient Israel before and after the exile where this sort of stuff could happen? And one of them are the Deuteronomists, whoever they were. There's this group of people, presumably priests, with a bit of a sort of prophetic edge, very invested in Mosaic covenant traditions. That represents one school of thought within ancient Israel and Judah. But there's another group which we can easily identify, and that's the temple priests, who are not Deuteronomists. And they're more... Um, I mean, if you took it into, into more contemporary terms, you've got the Methodists and you've got the Anglicans, okay? Uh, you've got the Methodists that are more heartfelt, taking it all very literally and personally and seriously, and then you've got the good old high church Anglicans that just want to make sure the candles are straight and the vestments are clean and so on, okay? Now, they're both perfectly respectable social communities, but they have different sets of values. So you can extrapolate that to the traditional priestly families whose job is to run the temple. And then you've got the enthusiasts who are taking it all very seriously and personally, who we call the Deuteronomists. Okay? And what's the interaction between them and to what extent is the production of the prophetic literature the result of that interaction? Okay? And were there any other factions? And So when we talk about J-E-D-P, it ends up really coming down to the Yahweh's tradition, the priestly tradition, and the Deuteronomist. And, to, and if they're the three big players when it comes to the Pentateuch, are they not also the three big players when it comes to the prophetic literature? Because we, we've got to be able to imagine plausible social locations for the generation and the preservation of this literature in Iron Age Jerusalem. So what role for the Deuteronomist? Was there an Isaiah school? Um, the creation of the Book of the Twelve seems a deliberate attempt to gather the material and there were 12 sons of Jacob and there were 12 months in the year and let's have 12 prophetic voices. Oh, we've only got 11, that's okay. Take the last couple of chapters off the 11th and make it into Malachi. Turn it into Malachi, which doesn't have the normal opening of a prophetic text. Okay. And we can see them wanting perhaps to balance the, you know, the Joshua Judges, Samuel Kings with Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and the Twelve. So these are redactional strategies playing into the creation of the ancient texts. What's the, sorry, Greg, what's the Isaiah school? Oh, the idea that um, between Isaiah Ben Amos living round about 740 to 700 BCE or flourishing that period, so he He's obviously going to be dead by 680 or so, mm -hmm. okay? But, but the Isaiah stuff keeps coming out. All right. And so we've got stuff about Cyrus, who's, you know, 539 or whatever. So how come the, uh, the book of Isaiah has material that some of which appears to be long in Jerusalem in the 8th century and some of it appears to be from Jerusalem in the 5th century? So you've got maybe 200, 300 years where the Isaiah scroll is taking shape. Now, um, did Isaiah predict all that stuff in the future mm -hmm. even though it wasn't relevant to his audience? That's the traditional answer. Or is the scroll of Isaiah like an archaeological tell which has got a core of Isaiah material and as, as, his, as his followers, his school, kept reflecting on his work and applying it to new situations, mm -hmm. the Isaiah scroll becomes the longest book in the Old Testament. And the same perhaps with Jeremiah, and maybe the same with Ezekiel, and certainly the same with the Book of the Twelve, where we know there are 12 separate books that have been put together to make one book. So there's a redactional strategy, a publishing strategy. So who's the editor? Who's putting this together? Well, the reality is we don't know. Um, it didn't matter at the time because it wasn't about them. They weren't looking for research points. So, if we then switch to look at the historical social science stuff, we, we ask questions about, so what do we know about prophets 
in the ancient Near East, and it turns out Israel wasn't the only country that had them. Okay, the Egyptians had them, the Babylonians had them, the Assyrians had them. In other words, this is a bit of cultural information which we've lost. But in the ancient world, in the Middle East, it was not uncommon. In fact, it was routine for any political ruler to have a group of people around who could be consulted about what do the gods want us to do. If, I, if we attack Iraq, will God bless us? In other words, will we get the oil or whatever? Okay. Well, let me see, Prime Minister. Okay. So this is the dynamic going on. And we actually have examples of prophetic speech and prophetic texts from ancient Assyrian, Babylonian and Egyptian cultures. And they're remarkably similar to what the, uh, I was going to say Israeli prophets, what the Jewish prophets, the prophets of Israel were doing in the 8th century. Which is interesting and exciting and dis disconcerting in some ways as well. There's the political context, which we've already talked about. If you live on the bridge between two big, powerful countries, you're going to either be very good at opening and shutting the gate, or you're going to be flattened repeatedly as they come backwards and forwards and take turns in coming backwards and forwards. So the political context. And one of the things the prophets do is they advise the king on whether or not, usually not, to go into an alliance with Egypt, Syria, Israel against Assyria, Babylon, and so on. Okay, and the prophets tend to be not in favour of alliances with other states. In the broader study of antiquity, this we're dealing here with a period called the Axial Period. It's also the time of um, the Buddha. It's the time of Zoroaster. It's the time of the great prophets of Israel. Okay, so some historians, some intellect, some cultural historians, talk about the great axial period when it's like the world turned on its axis. In other words, our world, the bits of the world we're familiar with, turned on their axis. And what they're saying there was a there's a discernible shift towards the individual. The importance of the individual, and we see it in India, we see it in, in Mesopotamia, we see it in Greece and we see it in Israel. Okay, So there's like there's something going on here in the world at that time, about two and a half thousand years ago. And to some extent the Old Testament is the product of this shift of consciousness around about 500, 600 BCE. Now, it doesn't mean they made it all up one night with, with you know, several casks of wine around a big table. They were pulling stuff together from their past but there's a whole new game in town and it's about individual accountability okay which is why the Deuteronomists are on the rise and the old temple mob that have been running the temple very well for thousands of years are on the back foot because there's a shift of culture something is changing about the way people see life and some people also say fun and games, we're living in the second axial period. And that's why traditional religion and traditional Christianity is struggling to find its feet because we're in a period where everything's up for grabs again. And the way we see what it means to be human, what, the way we see life, the way we understand the world is going through a, a major change and everything's being reoriented. That's an interesting word in its own sense, of course. All right, so this idea of the axial period going on in the ancient world. We get the emergence of ethical monotheism as one of the hallmarks of this axial period and a new focus on the individual. And also the emergence of the sacred text, the book, as the icon of political and religious power. It's no longer the temple, although the temples won't disappear straight away. Okay. So the house church might be emerging, the cell group might be emerging as the creative expression of church. The cathedrals won't disappear just yet, but they will, eventually. We'll go and look at them as museums. We might do that already in some cases. Okay, so, so as the holy place and the structure of holy people doing holy things and sacrificing animals and 
smashing incense around and so on, that gives way to this whole new idea of the tradition that's in a book. And so the interpreter of the book becomes more important than the priest at the altar. Okay? And that's, the, that's part of the prophetic legacy. And that also is another reason for asking, so did the Torah come before the prophets or after the prophets? Because in a sense, the focus on the... If you want to know what God is telling us, go and read the book where the prophet has told you. And what does Deuteronomy say? Moses is a prophet. Which he wasn't in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. wasn't in Genesis. But in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, he's not so much a prophet. Okay? But in Deuteronomy, Moses is identified as a prophet. And what does he do? He writes the words in a book and he tells the king to put this book next to your throne and get a Levitical priest to read it to you so that you will know what God wants you to do. Okay, that's um, Deuteronomy chapter 18. That's, you can only think that way after the prophets. People didn't think that way before the prophets. Okay, King David, if he existed, apparently did not have a copy of Deuteronomy under his chair. And if he didn't, who else didn't? And who did for the first time? The answer is probably Josiah, because it was his guys who put it out as the first edition. Okay, Second Kings 22. That's the official Old Testament scholarly position. I'm not sure it's that neat. But you know, it's, it's, it begins to make more sense around the time of Josiah, which is basically 625 to 609, when he comes home dead in a chariot. Um, or doesn't come home because he's dead in a chariot. And whereas it doesn't make sense to think that way with Uzziah or with Solomon or with David or with Saul. And even Samuel the prophet has never heard of things like Deuteronomy. Never, ne never, never comes into the storyline at all. But we just assume it's there because we all know that the Pentateuch comes before the prophets. But maybe the, one of the gifts of the prophets is the whole idea of the sacred book and the Torah is just the supreme exemplar of that legacy. So is there no reference to the law there? In the, in the prophets? Virtually not. It's, it's exceptionally rare. And where it does occur, it occurs more in the prophets that come towards the end of the story rather than the beginning. Yeah. So it, it's remarkable that there's, there's virtually no use made of the... Um, of the Pentateuchal traditions at all and when they are made they're in very general terms like you know the God of Abraham rather than something specific and certainly the prophets don't do the obvious thing which is to say guys here's the Ten Commandments now let's just do a little spiritual checkpoint here and see how the kingdom's going that dynamic is totally missing even though in Deuteronomy chapter 18 that's exactly the dynamic the king will have a copy of this law, that's where the word Deuteronomy comes from, copy of this law, okay, with him, and the Levitical priest will read it out to him so the king always knows exactly how to make the right decision. Well, that's a Levitical priest, a Deuteronomist, dreaming about how this place should be run. People like me should be there right next to the CEO telling him exactly what God wants done. It's never happened that way, and it never will happen that way because CEOs don't want the prophet standing right next to them telling them how to run the world okay but that's the prophetic dream of the deuteronomist put me in the boardroom i can make sure the king behaves himself meanwhile the king has disappeared courtesy of the babylonian empire i'm still here with the book so you better listen to me so the bible scholar ta-da okay trumps the priest or the bishop or the politician according to that worldview.